Thank you. Right, thank you for coming, sir. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Those of you who are here in person and those of you who are here virtually. Um, I was going to say good morning, but I understand that it may not be good morning to everybody who's watching. It's morning here, but it may not be mor morning where you're watching. Um, thanks for the in introduction. I really appreciate that. I'm, I'm hoping I can remember to include some of the points that you included in your introduction as I present today. So we'll see how that goes. Um, first of all, it's a pleasure and an honor to be here um, presenting for um, California Southern University. Um, someone came up to me before the session and said, well, you've presented before. I says, yeah, but never like this when there's cameras looking at you and people are located all around the world. And the gentleman said, well, just be yourself. I says, okay, well, I'll be myself, but uh, I, hope that, I hope that works for all of you. But anyhow, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, as part of my introduction I'm, I'm not what you would kind of call a line operator a person who's there on the front lines of customer service per se I don't work behind the front desk I don't work in housekeeping I don't work in the kitchen or in restaurant or food service but as an HR person who's kind of been at it for a long time, you learn the, the customer service and the importance of the relationship between um, selecting, developing, and retaining your exceptional talent. That really is what makes sure that customer service um, stays on course. And we have a lot of processes and systems in place um, that are really kind of part of our culture and part of the way we do business around the world So uh, that really help us get there. So um, bear with me if I drift off topic, but again, my main focus today will be talking about customer serv service, but really from the idea of putting people first, whether we're talking about the people who are the customers or the people who work inside our building. There's a real, there's a real link between uh, caring for people in such a way. Um, they're interrelated. Um, we'll spend some time also talking about engagement. And an engagement, for those of you in the business world or in the work world, have heard about the word engagement. And we use the word engagement as it relates to our associates or our workforce. Um, and my premise will be that if you have a highly engaged workforce, they are more well equipped to deliver exceptional customer service. So we'll spend a good amount of time talking about what we do as a company to engage our workforce and to make sure that their leaders are exceptional at doing that in their departments. And I will also say, um, not everybody's great at it in terms of leadership. So um, we, we profess and we believe in a lot of things that drive uh, associate engagement, but not every manager in every building is exceptional at that, and we like to recognize those who are. Um, I've got to find my, my clicker here and move on to our next slide. So the vision of Marriott is to be the number one hospitality company in the world. Um, and there are a lot of hospitality companies in the world. You all know them. Um, we do that by looking at the elements you see on the screen here of uh, the values, the values of our company, the things that measure our success, what our strategy is, as well as what is the purpose. I'm not going to be covering all of these bubbles today. I'm really going to be spending most of my time talking about values and strategy with a little bit of discussion on success measures, but wanted to give you kind of a loose idea of what the agenda will look like today. I would tell you that really the distinguishing factor or the differentiating factor, our company, other hotel and hospitality companies have beautiful facilities and buildings all around the world. Everybody has that. And the customers expect that. They want a nice facility where everything works, uh, everything is in working order, it's clean, people are friendly and hospitable, everybody wants that. But the things that make it different, no matter where you go, and it doesn't have to be in the hospitality business, it could be in a supermarket, it could be in a movie theater, it could be in a bank, if people even actually go into banks anymore, I don't know if they do. But it's that service piece that really is a differentiator. So when we have people that interact with guests, we like to call them moments of truth. Um, this moment of truth, it, they happen hundreds and hundreds of time, times a day. These moments when one individual has the opportunity to interact with another individual to either solve a problem or provide something that that guest is looking for, that's really where the magic happens. It's those instances when you, as a, as a worker or an associate, has the opportunity to interact with a guest. And how well equipped are you to meet those expectations of that guest or even exceed those? And that's something that we've learned over time uh, that is 
I think it's kind of inborn rather than trained. You can train some of it and you can uh, educate people on how they should behave. You can provide them with scripting and language that is appropriate and language that isn't appropriate. Um, touching on that briefly, uh, kind of a pet peeve of mine and it's become a pet peeve in many of the hotels where I work. Um, when people say to you or you do something and the person says back to you, no problem. No problem in our, in our world is something that has a negative connotation. When you provide a service for someone and they say thank you, you go, no problem. Was there a problem? No. We, we like to replace that with, it's my pleasure. Is there anything further I can do for you? So I, I think that um, the no problem issue may be generational um, to some degree, but we really try to mold people to get into this mindset of talking about it's my pleasure to serve you. It was my pleasure to take care of that issue for you. So it's little things like that that can make a difference. The language that you use, the scripting that, that sends a positive, um, positive message to the guests when you're, when you're serving them. So let's flip to the next screen here. So who are we? What is, what is Marriott made up of? Who are we? And you can see on the screen here that we are made up of over 300,000 um, employees or associates worldwide. You'll hear me use the word associates, employees interchangeably. We use the word associate mostly in, in the hotels, um, but they're, they're interchangeable. Um, Marriott operates in, I think this week we're in 74 countries around the world. Um, we have 18 brands. Some of the brands that you may have heard about are, are familiar to you. You may have heard, of course, you've heard of Marriott Hotels. You drive down the freeway here in Southern California, and there's one down the road in, in Irvine. There's one at Los Angeles International Airport, Newport Beach, all over San Francisco, all over the East Coast, Europe, everywhere else. Um, we have 3,700 hotels worldwide. It's a huge number. We have grown immensely, in the, particularly in the last 20 years. Um, this number of employees, 300,000, includes those of us who actually work for Marriott and some of us who work for what we call our franchise partners. The franchise element of Marriott's business has really exploded over the last 15 years. And some of that is because the, uh, the financial model really for franchise partners or for the owners of uh, franchise operators really works a little bit better in terms of costs. Um, sometimes the costs associated with being part of the Marriott package with all of the benefits that we offer also can be a cost issue because um, you, want, you want entry into the worldwide reservation systems, you want um, entry into the other benefits and so forth that the company offers. So sometimes it makes more sense from a business model for um, Marriott to be operated under a Marriott flag but managed by a company other than Marriott and those are our franchise partners and they're included in the 300,000 that I'm talking about today. Uh, as you can imagine, with a company that has grown internationally, um, I think when I joined the company, we had, I don't know, 100 hotels, maybe that. And that was, of course, many years ago, 34 years ago. And now we're at 3,700, so the growth has been really phenomenal. But as we've grown internationally, um, we've learned immensely from that. We've learned that in order to do business in foreign countries, you have to do a lot of learning about the culture of where you're doing business. Um, I think of an example of uh, when we first went into Asia. I, I believe um, Hong Kong may have been one of our first um, Asian properties. And what we did there innovatively, and we talk a little bit about innovation as we go through today, that um, it's routine to work a six-day work week in many parts of the world. Um, in our world, here in the United States, that's not really typically the norm. It's more norm that you would work a fi five-day work week, more typical than six. Well, one of the hotels that we opened in Hong Kong, we instituted a five-day work week. That was something that was kind of earth-shattering for them. It was something that they weren't used to, but it, it was something that um, they found valuable. I mean, it was something that they believed was, um, was different and good for them. And Marriott took that from their core values of working in the States, they transported that to working in a foreign country. That's not to say that we would ever want to impose our culture, the way we operate here in the US, into other countries around the world. That, that doesn't work either. But obviously then, um, we have a very, very diverse customer base, as you can imagine, operating in 74 countries around the world. But really, what kind of binds us all together as Marriott Associates worldwide is the set of core values that we have and how we operate under this set of core values. Um, I, I think you'll find this in a lot of large companies, but I don't know if they all do as good a job as Marriott does 
in bringing those core values into practice every day. And you can imagine in a large hotel, let's take a, let's take a hotel like um, the San Diego uh, Marriott Marquis and Marina um, down the road from us here in Southern California. That hotel has, um, last count, I think it's about 1,350 guest rooms. It's a pretty large hotel. Um, probably close to a thousand associates working in that building. And that's not to say that there are a thousand people working there every day, but they have a thousand people on their payroll. Um, you can imagine the, 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 the frontline leader's ability to motivate and energize those associates every day to deliver on every one of these core values and deliver on every one of these um, guest satisfaction kind of um, factors is not something that's always very easy, but it's something that we always focus on. Just like in any other thing you do in your life, you have some people who are very good at delivering service, some that are kind of okay, and some that aren't very good at all. So to make sure that everybody is trying to deliver against those core values and the focus on customer service, although not always 100% attainable, is always 100% focus of it. And we'll talk a little bit later today about how we measure that. How do we know that we're doing well at delivering exceptional customer service? How do we know that the leaders that are leading these associates in these buildings, how do we know that they're doing an excellent job of motivating those people, providing the opportunities for them to grow and so forth so they can feel like they're part of the Marriott family and they can deliver better service, simply stated. So let's um, flip to the next slide. I show this picture. There's actually kind of three or four pictures kind of morphed together here on the screen. But um, the individual in the middle, or the two individuals in the middle of this picture are J. Willard Marriott Sr. and his wife, Alice Sheets Marriott. Uh, this picture was taken in 1927. The, you can see the car on the left. I don't know if it's a Model A or a Model T, but it's an old car, but probably from the year 1927. When he and his wife drove across the country from Utah to Washington, D.C. to open a nine-seat A&W root beer stand in, in the nation's capital. Um, that is Mr. Marriott Sr., the former chairman of the company, standing in the doorway of his, what they call the hot shops. The hot shops were all over the place on the East Coast. I'm a pure West Coast guy. I've never seen a hot shop before, but uh, they're all over the East Coast. Um, and there he is standing in the, in the window. Or, I'm sorry, he's standing in the doorway. Um, the, even back in those days, and he, he developed these set of core values and, and they grew over time. But the one that really kind of stayed at the core of it was this issue of putting people first and making sure that you have a focus on people. That was really what he was all about. Um, but to go from a nine-seat A&W root beer stand to having 3,700 hotels worldwide, multinational, multi-billion dollar company is really amazing. There's not a lot of companies that have the sustainability go, to go from, I mean, we're at 84 working on our 86th year of being in business. That's, that's pretty amazing in this day and age that we have that kind of sustainability, something we're very, very proud of. Um, I think my next slide is a video. So I think we're going to take a look here at Mr. Marriott's, uh, the current Mr. Marriott, senior, of course, passed away some time ago, but Bill Marriott Jr., who until recently was the chief operating officer of the company, he's handed that off to another individual recently. Um, we'll see a couple of minutes of him talking about these core values of the company. So let's take a look at the video. I think everybody's favorite picture of Marriott is the original picture of the root beer stand where my father's standing in front with his arms crossed. I think about the very humble beginnings of that hole in the wall, nine stool A&W root beer stand. No way were they thinking about anything back then that we have become today. The hotel business is a highly personal business. We're taking care of people away from home. Putting people first means listen to their concerns, and I think that's really what we mean by giving people an opportunity. When you look at the fact that 50% of our general managers came out of the early ranks, and the average general manager's been around for 25 years, that says something about the enduring culture and the core value of the company. It's in my DNA to make sure that we've got a good product for our customers. 
I try and visit between 250 and 300 hotels a year. And I spend a lot of time worrying about, are we really doing a good job with our customers? Where are we falling down and why and how can we fix it? And that comes into the adage of success is never final, which means we're always looking for a better way to do things. I've always been a change maker. We're always looking over the hill for the next opportunity. We recognize there are different kinds of customers, different age groups, different demographics, different cultural backgrounds. We want to have a product that appeals to all of them. We are not too old to be cool. I think Akron with integrity has been a core value of Marriott for a long, long time, ever since we were formed. As we've grown our business around the world, we've been very, very careful to obey the law and do the best we can to provide service to our customers that is done with integrity. A hotel is a central part of every community. We've always been investing in our communities. We did everything we could to support the many charitable causes in the community. The community gives back to us big time because the more we're involved in the community, the better it is for business, the more business the hotel is going to attract. I think my favorite word is more. More hotels, more rooms, more satisfied customers, more opportunities for employees and associates to move up in the ranks. It means more countries, means more cities, a lot more innovation, new ideas, more success, more profitability for shareholders, and uh, more growth. More! I'm not sure if the lights come up. Yeah, there they go. That's perfect. Thank you. Um, I'll tell you just a couple of quick things about Bill Marriott. He is, um, he is a tough customer. <laughs> I don't mean a tough customer as a guest in a hotel, but <laughs> when he comes into the hotels, and he does hit 250 to 300 hotels every year, he's got to have a lot of frequent flyer miles. Well, I take that back. He probably has his own plane, so it's probably not that. <laughs> But um, when he comes to visit a property, he is just a stickler for details. I mean, it's unbelievable. He will look at guest rooms. He'll look at ballrooms. He'll look at carpet. He'll look at paint. He'll look at how the rooms are made. He'll go into the kitchen. He'll make sure that in the kitchen that the, the temperature gauges are all the way they're supposed to be. He'll make sure that the food is all labeled. He'll make sure that people, everybody has a name tag, that they're crisp looking. So it's kind of a, interesting to watch him come to a hotel or right before he comes to the hotel, there's like a cleaning frenzy and people are just going crazy. You know, we like to be like that all the time and we talk amongst ourselves in the hotels that, you know, why do we go through this craziness when Bill Marriott's coming? We should have that same passion for cleanliness and excellence every day. And we do, but when the chairman's coming, it's a little bit of a different picture. Um, he talked about the general managers coming from among the hourly ranks. Um, uh, I was talking with one of, the, one of the audience a little bit earlier, and I says, well, should I talk about my education background? I've, it's been a long time since I've been in academia, so this is a little bit of a new setting for me. Uh, but our business is the kind of business that you may not necessarily need an advanced degree for, for, as witnessed by the general managers who work their way up from potentially a van driver, from a front desk clerk, or from a culinarian up through the ranks. It's the kind of business that gets into your blood and you just enjoy it. And uh, that's what happened to me. I came out of a, a, the University of California, Santa Barbara. I have a bachelor's degree, a very basic uh, bachelor's degree with a, a major in liberal arts with a minor in foreign language has really nothing to do with the hospitality industry. But I think when they hired me, they were saying, hey, here's a person that seems to have the, the spark of personality that would work in our business. And the beauty of it is, once I got in, the amount of training and development that they gave me and allowed me to grow and allowed me to explore new things and, and do what I was good at, I think that's really kind of the message. If you have a team of associates that work for you, um, oftentimes we get we get caught up in the issue of finding the things that they didn't do quite right and wanting to correct those things or discipline rather than letting them soar with their strengths and finding out the things that they're exceptional at 
reinforcing that and finding the right path for them. And that's what happened with so many of the general managers in, in, in our business. Um, I've worked with many of them who have worked their way up through the ranks. And uh, they've been around for a long time. We, we know that we have great retention rate amongst our management staff compared to others in the hospitality industry. And it has something to do with our culture. I really believe that. Um, let's see. In his video, he talked about it being a highly personal business. When you think about the fact that you're caring for people away from home, when you have that mentality to say, you're in, you're in my home, you're a guest in my home, I'm going to treat you different than if you're just another body checking into a business, if you follow me. You want to make sure that they feel that exceptional service when they're there. And you have to do that by listening to their concerns. Uh, he talked about making sure that the product is always excellent. Um, you know, we, we typically were a, what I would consult, we, I would call us conservative in nature. We didn't have a lot of flash and a lot of glitz in our business, but you could always count on the consistency of product, of service, wherever you went. You get a Marriott burger in Newport Beach, you get a Marriott burger in Miami, or maybe you get a Marriott burger in Berlin, but you get a Marriott burger that's the same wherever you go. And there's something to be said for that consistency, whether it's a food product or it's the room and how the room is laid out and the kind of services are offered inside. So um, that product excellence is, is exceptional. Um, he mentioned that success is never final. Um, this, you know, embracing change and being willing to try new things. What does the customer need? Does the customer need different things now than they did 20 years ago? What are their expectations? And although we may, that may not have been our nature, as we began to recognize what the customer needed, we had to be able to, to flex and bend with those new, new needs of the customer. Think about it from a technological standpoint, particularly, or even what a lobby is laid out like. You'll, you'll notice as you look into a lobby in a hotel anymore, you'll see what we call the great room, or these rooms, that are a room that's a lobby, but it's also a social gathering place. There may be food and beverage served. It's a big open space rather than just a lobby with nothing in it besides a front desk and an elevator where you go to check in. That's something that the customer has demanded over the years, something that looks a little bit different. Not unique to us, but it's something that we embrace as part of change. He also spent some time talking about integrity. Uh, doing business with integrity. There's a couple of lines that he uses. I want to share those with you. Um, he says that how we do business is as important as the business we do. And I think you talk about living in a world that's highly litigious and a lot of compliance and so forth. There's a lot of things that we have to do very carefully, not only in our own country, but around the world. So doing business with integrity is really part of, of who we are. It is part of our core. All of the managers in the Marriott hotels once a year participate in an affirmation that they have done business with integrity over the past year. They ask questions, have you ever seen this? Anything that looked um, unethical to you? No, 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 but if you did, can you share that with us? So they really reinforce this important of, importance of working uh, in, with, with high levels of, 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 of ethics. Super, super important. He says that if you can't get it done by doing it the right way, don't do it. Don't cut corners. Don't try to do something a little bit, you know, go take a shortcut somewhere. Go through all the steps and processes that you need to to ensure that if had there ever been an audit or something that someone was investigating books or looking at how you handle certain transactions, that it was done with integrity and there would never be any question. Uh, obviously that, you know, people who don't act with integrity in any business, you know, suffer the consequences of such. But it's, it, it, it is part of, uh, of, of our core values and, and, and who we are. Um, serving our world, um, the, the importance of being involved in community is also extremely important to us from a core, value, core values perspective. Um, the Spirit to Serve that we have, and I'll show you a picture of a book in a few minutes called The Spirit to Serve that was really written by Bill Marriott. Um, it's really that spirit that makes our culture more vibrant, the, our willingness to care and work with others and be active in the communities where we do business. Um, and and it, it, it makes the business stronger and it makes the world a better place. One of the um, live participants or live uh, audience today was asking me about sustainability and uh, how we operate with sustainability, whether it's for conservation, energy conservation, the use of water. Um, we've done some work uh, in the Amazon uh, rainforest, uh, protecting uh, the rainforest there. We offer to our guests many times in many hotels, I'm not going to say every hotel, we offer them whether they want to have their bed changed every day or not. 
Now, at home, we don't change our bed every day, and I think that there may have been a, a long-standing uh, expectation that when you go to a hotel, your bed linens get changed every single day. You still, they will do that, but they will also give you the option to say, you know what, you don't need to change my linens today. It's a water saving, it's an energy saving, it helps the productivity of the business as well. You've got people doing maybe not as much intense work, and hey, I don't need my bed linens changed every day, but there's a sustain sustainability piece to that. Charitable work, we're very big in charitable wor work. A couple of the large things that we are involved in as a company are Children's Miracle Network. We also do work with the Habitat for Humanity. Um, locally here in Orange County, we're very active with the Second Harvest Food Bank, uh, working with the food bank that's uh, down here at the Great Park in Irvine. Um, so it's another part of our core value. Serving our world means that we have to be involved in the, in the communities where we do business. It's very, very important. So those are some of the values that we just talked about. We talked about the pursuit of excellence, that, you know, taking, uh, putting people's first, uh, take care of the associates. The associates will take care of the guests. It sounds very simple and basic, but that's who we are at our core. Take care of the associates. The associates will take care of the guests. And kind of the addendum to that that's not really written, the guests will return. And if you think about the ability to have the guests return again and again, that's a good, solid business model. But it starts with the frontline associate. It goes to the guest. The guest return brings, brings business back. And that's why putting people first is so vitally important to us. So here's the Spirit to Serve book. This, I think it was published in, I want to say 99, 98. I can't remember the exact date of the publication. But I thought I'd read this quote from the book. When he says, Dad, he's referring to his father. Uh, Bill Marriott Sr., J. Willard Marriott, he says, Dad felt very strongly that the concerns and problems of the people who worked for him were always worth listening to. In his eyes, a successful company puts its employees first. I couldn't agree more, he continues. When employees know that their problems will be taken seriously, that their ideas and insights matter, they're more comfortable and confident in turn, they're better equipped to deliver their best on the job and to the customer. Everyone wins, the company, the employee, and the customer. And I think that that's, that just kind of encapsulates the philosophy of putting people first. Um, I, I would also tell you that we operate kind of on what we would call a balanced scorecard approach to our business. It's kind of a three-legged stool if you want to think of it like that. We have associate engagement or the level of satisfaction that your associates working for you feel. You have the level of satisfaction that the guests experience when you stay. And of course, it's, it's a business. You have the financial excellence as well. So where there always has to be a balance. You have to put people first. Could be the guests, could be the associates. That's those two legs of the stool. But we're in business to make money. And there is a, it's profitability that we're also looking for. So you have to have all three of those pieces together um, or the whole package doesn't work well. I would also argue that, <coughs> pardon me, if you put too much emphasis on one of the legs of the stool, the stool becomes imbalanced. Um, I, I know a hotel that did an exceptional job or has done an exceptional job of driving great, great profitability to Marriott International and to the owners of their building. Sometimes, however, that could have the effect of maybe because I'm making such a strong focus on the financial side that I may miss the customer piece, or I may miss the associate piece because I'm so focused on making money. So my message is you have to make sure you have a balance of all of those for it to, for the business to wholly be successful. So I, I thought this quote was, was very telling. Here's that quote again, put people first. Take care of the associates and they will take care of the customer. So how do we put people first? What are the, some of the things that we do to put people first? I mean, I would say it sounds easy, but, you know, sounds easy does hard. You know, it's not as easy to just say, hey, we put people first. But unless you really put people first, I would ask how. How do you put people first? What is it that you do that proves that you actually do put people first? And here's some examples. You have to provide tools and training. These are some of the things that we measure when we measure the level of engagement of our workforce. We want to know, do you have the tools necessary to do your job? Do you have enough linen to make the beds? Do you have enough pots and pans to cook? How about your uniforms? Are you, you have enough uniforms? Are your uniforms in great shape? 
If you don't have those kind of tools to carry out your job every day, it's a little bit difficult to feel like you're providing the highest level of customer service. So provide tools and training on how to do the job. In terms of um, the selection process, I would say here, you know, hire for attitude rather than hiring for experience. And I mean, that, that kind, of, kind of makes some people shiver that, you know, you've heard the stories about people being overqualified for a job or uh, it's, it's a tough call. But I would rather hire somebody that demonstrated through their interview that they have a capacity to deliver great service. I can, they could even teach me how to check people in and out of a hotel. That's not my forte, but I could learn those mechanical steps. But can I learn that ability to provide exceptional service? I think it's something that you have to have inside you. Like I said earlier, you can learn some of the verbiage and the language and the behaviors that you demonstrate. But if it's already in you, it makes it a lot easier for you to be successful in their job. Um, rewarding excellence. This is a, could be a recognition piece. It could be reward in terms of financial reward. I mean, a salary, a competitive salary is obviously part of that. But we want to make sure that the people feel recognized. When we survey our folks, we find that um, usually one of the, the areas where I think businesses suffer most when you ask people, well, you know, do you feel like you're, you're paid adequately for the job that you do? I think if you ask for a show of hands, everyone says, oh yeah, I feel like I'm paid adequately for the job or I'm paid well. Well, you could always make more. People will always be satisfied to make more. But you know, paying people competitively is just the price of entry. You got to have that. But what about the recognition piece? What about the recognition beyond just getting a paycheck? Do I feel valued? Do I feel important? And does the boss that leads me make me feel valued? That's a form of recognition, and if I'm recognized and I know that they value me, valuing me also takes into consideration that they knew who I am, they know what my problems and concerns are, because I tell people, you know, when you hire somebody, even though you hear this, this comment about, well, you know, you leave your personal problems at the door, I, I think that that's an unexpect, uh, um, what's the word I'm looking for? An unreasonable expectation. Because when you hire people and you bring people into your world, you hire the whole person with all their baggage and all their positives and so forth, that you know, if people are having personal issues, if a manager is so engaged with their people that they know what's going on in their world, within limits, of course, that really sends, says that you value me and I'm important to you, and therefore I'm more willing to go out and go the extra mile in terms of providing service to the guest. Opportunity to learn and grow. Um, we've learned uh, over the years that sometimes more than the last couple of things I've talked about, um, particularly with adults, they need to learn and grow. That's extremely important to them. So we've taken great lengths to make sure that our associates have, uh, and as technology has changed, huge amounts of learning opportunities online for them. Um, classroom learning, of course, for some of the standards that we require, but there's a lot of things that I could go out as an associate access online, whether it's about public speaking, whether it's about balancing my checkbook, any of these things could be life skills, could be work skills. Um, that um, that's another indicator that we value you. We're going to provide you this stuff that's going to help you in the real world and it's going to help you in your work world as well, as well. And to Bill Marriott's comment about people growing on the job, that's how do you get to the next level unless you have the opportunity to grow and learn new things. Leadership has to be accessible. I don't want to beat a dead horse with this issue, but um, the, the leader in our business that stays behind the scenes in their office all the time, unless they work in accounting, um, they they aren't as successful. Um, it, it's important for them to be available to their people. So management must be accessible. And they need to know that they were heard. When I say, we hear you, we have this process when we do an engagement survey and we gather data about our associates, we ask for their feedback. We actually put posters in our hotels that says, we heard you. And we list the things that they brought up as the top three or four concerns that they had in their department that would indicate Hey, if you could work on these couple of things for us as a department, we'd be golden. We'd be even more happy and excited about working here than we are already. So they've got to, be, they've got to know that they've been heard. So in terms of strategy, that was one of the other, other buttons, uh, of the circles in terms of achieving our, our, our vision. We talk about, I'm not going to touch on all of these, but some. In order to reach that goal of being the number one hospitality company in the world, we've got to make sure that we're in tune to the next generation of travelers. 
and I would say from an HR person's perspective, and the next generation of workers that are coming into the workforce. The, the workers that are coming into the workforce are much, much different when I, than when I came into the workforce. Their needs, their motivations are very much different. Same thing with travelers. The travelers, you have to be in touch with what these, this new generation of travelers is, is all about. Gen X, Gen Y, the future guests, right? Um, in terms of brand distinction, um, in innovation and in, uh, differentiation is critical from brands. We have a lot of different brands in Marriott, 18 of them I mentioned. Um, and every client or traveler may want something different. They may want the economy. They want, may want something that we would call extended stay, residence in. Uh, they may want a resort experience. They may want um, a Ritz-Carlton experience. Ritz-Carlton, for those of you who don't know, is also part of the Marriott family. So every brand is, is innovative and different, and it's, it's really tiered towards a certain profile of customer. Um, portfolio power is really about, um, you know, do we have loyalty to those brands? Is, do we have a wide enough portfolio that can really service all of the different uh, guests that we're looking for? And then technology. Um, Technology is one of those things. I was talking to one of the uh, one of the audience earlier about, you know, it's funny how sometimes you go to the smaller, more economical parts of uh, 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 economical hotels, and they'll offer free breakfast and they'll offer free internet. But the more higher up you go in the chain in terms of more expensive, more luxury, you don't get anything for free. <laughs> and uh, I, I think that technology, though, is one of those things that we have really, really worked hard to, although we don't all, always offer it free in all of our buildings, we've placed a lot of focus on technology and building technology because that's what the new generation particularly needs. We expect it. And when technology doesn't work, believe me, in a hotel, it's a nightmare. It's horrible. Um, owner preference, uh, just touching briefly on the owner preference piece, is that Marriott, uh, years ago, used to own a lot of the buildings that they operate. They do not do that anymore. They are not the owners of the buildings that you see with the Marriott name on them. Other owners own them. Um, REITs, real estate investment trusts, and so forth, generally own, own the businesses, and Merit operates them. So Merit is the management company that, that operates the hotel on behalf of an owner. So, uh, but we want owners to like us more than they like Starwood or Hilton or Hyatt, right? Um, but owner preference is key because they're the ones that are going to help invest in making sure your product is up to date, that you have the technology and so forth. Because funding for changes and so forth in hotels that you need to make on a regular basis don't only come from Marriott, they also come from the ownership group as well. We talked a little bit about global growth. Um, this is a slide that's a little bit of an enigma to me. I can talk quickly through it, but rather than do that, I think I may just skip onto the next slide if you're okay with that. So I wanted to get into a piece about what we call service excellence training. Service excellence training is a piece that after an associate has been hired with us, within the first 30 days, they must have attended a service excellence class. It's a full day class. And service excellence talks about, at the bottom, focusing on associate, uh, uh, associates inspiring performance. They want, th the guests expect to be able to be inspired when they're there, to do what they need to do. You, we have to focus people on exceeding the expectations of those guests. We want to make sure we act professionally, and we have to be empathetic and, and compassionate. The word empathy comes up a lot in the world of service delivery. I'll talk about that in a second. But in the upper right-hand corner, we've learned through a lot of research that the customers want to be able to perform, to connect, and to recharge. I mean, it sounds like you've really kind of cut it down to a very basic three things, but when they come, when we say perform, business traveler wants to be able to, to do the things that they need to do to be successful in their business, to be productive, to connect. Connect could be connecting with other people, could also be connecting through the internet, and they also want the ability to recharge. It's my home away from home. Do I have a place to go to a gym? Do I have a relaxing area to go? to go to. That's what the guests are looking for. And we train against that. Um, I have, I think the next slide is a card, and I'll show you that in a second. But this is what we know about the guests. I think that this data is maybe about a year, maybe two years old, but it hasn't changed dra dramatically since. That the average age of the guest is 45 years old. They're college educated. They're 62% male and 38% female. 72% of them are married and many with children. And they make about 24 trips a year. Now that's not everybody, but that's kind of the prototypical Marriott guest. I would tell you that you talk about making 24 trips a year. There are people who, um, for example, at the Irvine Marriott. The Irvine Marriott is a business hotel. 
that's really their core is, is, is it's, it's a business hotel. We have people that spend 100 nights a year at that hotel. I mean, that would be grueling for any of us, I think, to spend 100 nights in a hotel, but it's part of the business that they do. So, but again, you've got to be ready to, um, you, you imagine this person that comes 100 times through the doors of your hotel. The ability, I mean, you have a great opportunity as a service deliverer to recognize that guest. You've seen them, you know, 99 times before. You're using their name, you know about their family, you know where they come from, you know where they're going. And to have that kind of interaction, that personal attention to that guest, especially for the ones that come back again and again and again, has a huge level of value. But this is what we focus on. So this is the basics card. I brought one with me today. I carry it with me. It's part of my uniform. It's a fold-out deal. It looks like this. Um, I'll talk about the brand standard, uh, standard audit very briefly. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it. But this basics card is every f it's five days a week. The weekends are reserved for a review of the prior week. But each one of these has one of what we call our genuine care basics. So we are in the fifth week of the year for us. And so that would be like week one. So one, two, three, four, back to week one. The basic today is to prepare. Prepare says, prepare for each guest's arrival, plan for VIPs and Marriott Rewards guests, ensure I have the right tools and information. So this is something that's reinforced every day. We have what we call a daily stand-up or a huddle. Beginning of every shift, everyone groups together. They talk about the VIPs in-house. They talk about the basic of the day. They ask for examples from among the staff. Can you share an example for, uh, of being prepared? How, what can you do today to be prepared? So it's acculturating this issue of this basic one a day, every day, no matter where you are in the company, the basic of the day today is prepare. So it's a consistency, it's company-wide, and it's something that's easy for everybody to latch on to, and you carry it with you. And the brand standard audit means that we have auditors that Marriott hires an outside company, and they come and they audit your performance, and they, they spend time in your building, they order room service, they use the spa if there's a spa, um, and they ask everybody, let me see your basics card, and do you know what the basic of the day is? So reinforcing that helps to deliver the service on a positive, uh, a positive sense. So I wanted to show you a couple of examples of things that we do to kind of energize and motivate our associates. Uh, I don't know if any of you are Spanish speakers or not, but we have a translation. On the left-hand uh, side, we have this uh, picture of the thing that we call la cama perfecta, the perfect bed. This is a way that we talk about our, our survey information and we talk about is everything completely clean? What's the completely clean score? What is your housekeeping doing? Are they doing an excellent job? So this was something that was developed at one of my properties where we wanted to, to kind of allow the, the, the ladies in housekeeping to feel excited and motivated towards achieving what they call the perfect bed. And on the right hand side of the screen, you see their completely clean scores. Completely clean is one of the questions on the guest satisfaction survey. But the comma perfecta was something that's a big sign. It's in the room. They talk about it every day. And it ener energizes them. For that week, they're going to focus on making sure that the bed is perfect. Next month, it may be the perfect bathroom, or it may be the perfect floor, the perfect carpet, whatever. But it's just a way in that department to energize those associates to make sure they have a focus on, uh, on cleanliness in this example, which is their job. But it's one kind of fun thing. And the tracking of the scores and which housekeepers are doing an exceptional job, how they're doing compared to all the other hotels in Marriott on those scores, so they can feel motivated to be number one. They'd like to be at the top of the heap. I think in this particular week, it looks like they're like one one, 100 out of 277 properties. Not bad. I mean, not at the top, but working in the right direction. I want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about engagement. I've kind of touched on it briefly, but it says here that it really go means going beyond alignment, making sure we're just all on the same page, to really make sure that you have the hearts and minds of your associates through the shared values that we have as a company. So engagement is a very huge part of what we do in Marriott, and I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about um, What's our strategy behind engaging our workforce? It's kind of a three-pronged approach. We do an annual survey. We do it once a year. It is just a snapshot. It's not something that's being uh, asked all the time. But from the time of survey to the time we receive the data back, we get into a data sharing process. We do a debrief and feedback. And then we do action planning behind the results of that survey. So let's move through this rather quickly. So. These are the, what we call the drivers of associate engagement. These are the things that 
make me feel like I'm willing to go above and beyond as a member of the team at the hotel that I work at. These are the five major drivers of associate engagement, and you can see them listed there. I really kind of highlight the, the first two because when you look at a survey that's about, it's a technological survey, it's all done online. When I started the company, they did it in pencil and paper and mailed it in. Now it's all done online. And um, you know, technologically, you think of our workforce, sometimes may not have high degrees of, of written uh, communication skills sometimes, or technology comfort isn't always there either. But you'd be amazed to see the growth of how associates have become more and more adept at using, adept at using the technology to conduct their survey. It's, it's really an amazing thing when necessity becomes, I've got to use technology, they learn to use technology. It's really fascinating. But leadership excellence and the quality of my life at work have more, a huge, probably 50 to 60 percent of the questions drive around leadership excellence and quality of life at work. So you think about that, leadership is really the key. We ask a lot of questions about, it's about equally divided between my immediate supervisor does X, Y, Z, agree or disagree. Then there's an equal number of questions about senior leadership. Does senior leadership do X, Y, Z? And we evaluate senior leadership and we evaluate frontline supervision. My argument is, is that really where the rubber really meets the road is with that frontline supervisor. The person that really drives engagement. You could have an exceptional general manager, inspirational, motivational general manager, but if the person that's there face to face working with these bodies and groups of associates every day, if they don't have it, it doesn't matter how great the leadership is at the top. At the top. So that's a critical role. That frontline manager, supervisor person is unbelievably important. So, so here's what we do after we, da we data share, we debrief and feedback, we look at comparisons. How did, how did a hotel or a department do year over year? How did they do versus the total organization? So you look at a kitchen department at, uh, in San Francisco. How did the kitchen department at the San Francisco Marriott do in comparison to that same kitchen department a year ago? How do they stack up against the total hotel? How do they stack up against um, Marriott? As a, as a total organization. We measure that. Really the better focus is am I improving year over year? Maybe less important of how I compare to the rest of the organization as am I making progress upward on my level of engagement year over year. Um, we also sometimes there's a little bit of a delay. You get the data back and maybe 30, 60 days before you're sharing. I said, well, when you took the survey back in June, this is what it looked like. Does it still look the same? You got to gather current state information from them. So the snapshot that you took in June it may not be a reality by the time you get to August or September, so you have to kind of level set once again to make sure that the, the mood that, the, that they provided for you in June when they took the survey is the same today. So if you're thinking about surveying associates or talking about the value of doing that, make sure you discuss the time lag piece. Um, ask the people how are they doing. Um, what, one thing that's key in these follow-up meetings is that you gain departmental consensus. We, were, we would say if um, if you could pick as a group the top three things that if we worked on, we could make it a better place to work for you, what are those? And they agree as a group, and then leadership puts in motion things to pick off those three or four things that they chose as being the single or most important things to work on in their department. We use an external facilitator. When we say external, I mean external to the department. I may come in and facilitate a meeting for them. We have what we call a senior work environment manager that, that goes to properties. And that senior work environment manager typically will go to uh, departments within hotels that may be struggling from an engagement perspective. Nobody from the hotel is there with them. It's a little disarming for them. They don't have to feel like they're talking to a member of the team that's an outsider. They work for Marriott, but they're outside the day-to-day -day operation of the hotel. You get a lot more honest feedback, I think, when you uh, operate like that rather than to uh, have a mem another member of management team from within the building isn't quite as powerful. So the action planning piece for me is the single most important step. You can ask people to survey. You can gather data. But if you do nothing with that data, you're shooting yourself in the foot. You've got to go back and make sure that you've listened to them, that you put a solid action plan in place, that they're published, that you report those findings up to senior management in terms of how you're doing on those action plans. They're monitored monthly and quarterly to see are we reacting to the things that the survey said and checking back with your people. It could be departmental meetings you see at the bottom. Uh, and the indexed on survey data, I don't need to talk about that. But the action planning piece is the single, single most critical part of surveying, asking how well you think your people are engaged or not. I draw attention to a book here um, by Beverly Kay and Sharon Jordan Evans. It's called Love Em or Lose Em. This is an awesome book for follow-up for engagement. And it's really a simple little tool. I would recommend it if you have any interest in this. It's set up like um, an alphabet. 
there's 26 letters, and each of those letters, A to Z, is a strategy for building engagement. It's an exceptional tool to use. Uh, we have a program that we call Engaging the Hearts and Minds of Your Associates, and it's t it talks about we know, we were told many years ago that there was going to be a labor shortage happening. I don't think it's happened yet. The, you know, the economy you know, went into the tank. But at some point in the future, there will be a shortage of labor, particularly in the kind of business, very labor intensive business that we operate in. There will be a shortage of labor. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we hire and retain the best of the best. So how do you do that? You do it by engaging the hearts of minds of your associates. And the book is called Love Them or Lose Them. Love them meaning the care and feeding of your exceptional associates and all of your associates will make them want to stay. You've got to hold on to them. You don't want them to go somewhere else. Because in a labor shortage, that would be very bad for you. But this is an awesome book. I would encourage you to take a look at it. Again, frontline leader is the key on in, in uh, measurement and strategy of engagement. They, people want to be provided with um, provide, uh, meaningful and challenging work. It, it's got to be a job where I feel like it's interesting and challenging for me. Think about making the job challenging and interesting for a housekeeper who's cleaning 14 rooms every day. Just think of it as a challenge. How do you do that? How do you motivate that to be challenging? You make it fun. You do the cama perfecta. You do something to where they feel engaged and excited about the work they're doing and see how making that room completely clean plays into the overall satisfaction of the guest. So making work challenging and meaningful is very, very important. Respect, I don't think I need to say much more about respect. Everybody, I don't care what level you are, you want to be treated with respect as an individual, and that's critical. Listening and follow through and be visible and available to your, to your people. Some quick metrics here about higher engagement uh, within Marriott. One of the questions we ask is, did you experience a problem when you were with us? We know that if you have a highly engaged workforce, that the, the guests are 11% less likely to experience a problem. And here's some statistical data for you to say that high engagement does translate to higher levels of, um, of guest satisfaction. Turnover. In highly engaged workforces in our hotel populations, the 20% uh, uh, reduction in turnover. And again, we can't speak enough. I think there was a comment about the cost. Um, I think the, 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 the dean who presented talked about the cost of turnover. Um, we've measured that. You know, depending on your job, if you lose a general manager or a senior sales executive, the cost of that turnover is immeasurable in terms of uh, loss of productivity, knowledge loss. People walk out the door, you lose knowledge. Getting back up to that level is incredible. Um, and then for properties, um, and the finance people love this, that uh, the productivity is 14% greater among the hourly workforce if they're highly engaged. And productivity means you're spending less on labor based on for each room that you have to clean or operate, you have less of that. So I want to talk now about how we measure guest satisfaction. We call it GSS. If you hear me using the acronym, acronym GSS, it means Guest Satisfaction Survey. These are some of the key drivers. These are not all of them, and I'll show you a chart in a second. There's an overall satisfaction question. And for us, and for those of you who are um, maybe Marriott travelers at some point in, your, in time, we want you to be completely honest on your survey. Because anything that's a seven or below, it might as well be a zero for us. So, but be completely honest, that's the only way we can get better. We look at the arrival and departure experience. They are actually asked, what was your arrival experience like? How about your departure? How was staff service overall? Staff service overall is one of the things that rests in my, in, in my area. I am uh, tasked with making sure that the staff service overall is excellent. Even though I'm not a, a frontline person, I want to make sure that there, there are some subcategories to staff service overall, like skilled and well-trained, felt empowered to make decisions. Those kind of things impact how the kind of staff service that will be delivered to our guests. Everything in working order, TV remote doesn't work, internet doesn't work, the hot water doesn't work. Everything in working order is another key driver, as well as room completely clean. And I'm going to show you a couple of reports that we get on this. We call it, there's a pulse report that will look at uh, a particular hotel, and it would, it would compare it to the brand. And when they say the brand, it's like if I'm talking about a Ritz-Carlton, they will take my Ritz-Carlton, they'll compare it against every other Ritz-Carlton to see where I am. Am I 10 out of 100? Am I 40 out of 100? Am I 80 out of 100? Where am I on that list? So there's a comparison for like product. They're not going to compare a Fairfield Inn to a Ritz-Carlton, but they'll, they'll segment it by brand to determine how are you performing compared to all the other hotels in that brand. 
and you can look at for a specific market. There's an area vice president in this part of the world that covers all of Southern California. She can look at all of the hotels in her area and determine how are my hotels doing as it relates to guest satisfaction. So she knows where she can place attention. And there's some very, very rigorous um, accountability, for lack of a better word. When guest satisfaction scores fall below a norm that they should be at, there's a huge degree of accountability from that area vice president to the local general managers and um, conversely down to the executive committee and operating managers if those service scores are not being maintained. So it's business and it's part of how we're evaluated and so forth. So it's, it's very important that we do anything we can to lift scores. Sometimes there's a concern that a product or an aging product might, might impact service scores. Uh, I would tell you that in Marriott, you might have a tough product. They may give you a little bit of leeway, but still, you may have a tough or struggling product that's in need of a redo and you won't get it till next year or potentially the year after. The expectation, though, is even with a tough product, your service has to shine. In fact, it has to shine more in a struggling product than it does in an exceptional product. Uh, and then we have an opportunity map, and I'll show you that in a, a, a second. Each property is targeted with the certain drivers that apply just to that property based on a prior year's data. These are where your opportunities lie, and it allows the properties to then, the properties, I'm sorry, the hotels, to focus on what areas of guest satisfaction they should really put their energy behind. And we get that from a report. So this is kind of a little bit of an eye chart. I just want to give you an idea that where it says Pulse Report, you see down at the bottom the property key drivers. Uh, this example, you know, the name of the property has been, you know, um, hidden to, you know, protect the innocent. But you see across the bottom there, you have a January to June window, and then you, you, uh, later in the year you will have a July through December window. So this is an, obviously an early reporting. It's a very fresh report. It's um, maybe a couple of weeks into January that you can see the, in this example, if you look on the right-hand side, because the, the, the January to June piece and the 2013 year-to-date piece, those are the same numbers because we're just in January. But you see it on the right-hand side, we compare it to the brand. So how are all the other hotels in the Marriott Hotel brands, again, this is just standard Marriott hotels, how do we compare? You can see on that first one, um, room comfortable for relaxing. This particular property was at a 76.5 on a brand standard, of a brand average of 82. Um, staff, go down four or five bullet points, you see staff, skilled and well-trained, operating at an 87.5 against a brand of 88.1. Pretty darn close there. So you can see the scores here are pretty good. They still, you know, it's early in the year. They're going to look at this and measure this from a January to June uh, perspective. But uh, then I wanted to tie that back to what I mentioned before, which is the opportunity map. It's completely impossible to read. But I will tell you that these items on the bottom left-hand side of your screen are the same things that you see here on the right-hand side of the opportunity map. This is through software that Marriott has contracted with an outside company to gather this data and show us where the highest opportunities are. Well, you'd think, why wouldn't you go first priority, second priority? second priority, third priority, fourth priority. The part on the right-hand side, if you notice at the top, those are the more high importance. So focus on the high importance. Even though this dark green slide is, it's actually third in the importance of key drivers, but it's of higher importance to the guest. So those are the areas that you would focus. So the opportunity map is reflected over here in the property key drivers. It's a great little tool to tell you where you can go and look deeper uh, down uh, off to the left of each of those boxes that I've circled, you see a check mark, which is just a, tr it'll, it, it's a trend graph. You push the button and it'll show you how you're trending on that particular question over the last six months or a year. The left of those two little boxes to the left of the actual data, you can click on that and it'll provide the actual guest comments and responses on that particular question. So it really allows us to dig very, very deep to know what exactly, what things actually happen to that customer, which then allows us to go back and either retool, reprocess, or, 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 or rework our processes to make sure that we're focusing on the things and you begin to look at a trend and see the kind of issues that crop up again and again and again, that's where you put your energy. I mean, it's the, you know, focus on the things that you have happening 80% of the time, not, ha not focus on the things that only happen 20% of the time. But this allows you to go really deep, hear particular comments, uh, positive or negative about a, a, an associate guest interaction or a potentially negative associate guest interaction. We have to address not only the exceptional, but we also have to address the, uh, the challenges that some of our associates have in being extremely hospitable with their guests. It's kind of interesting that internet speed is over 
<laughs> yeah. It, you said internet speed is over uh, a bathroom cleanliness. I, I would tell you that in, in this day and age, internet, if internet is not working, the expectation is that internet works all the time and it's free, right? And it works at a high speed. <laughs> yeah, it works, but it's slow. That's a, that becomes a dissatisfier. Even though you have it, even if it were free, right? Oh, yeah, right. So I, I guess I, I, this is kind of a closing slide. It says exceptional customer service can only be achieved if every individual that interacts with your guests has a passion for service and feels like a valued member of your business. So that's just kind of tying the high engagement, the passion for service on the part of the associate is what nets you exceptional customer service. And I think with that, we're just about ready to move into any questions that might Thank be there. Thank you so much, Tony. I'll, I'll get started with the... Thank you. I'd start with some from the uh, virtual audience, and I'll let the in-person audience here have a moment to gather their thoughts. Uh, I like this question. When you, uh, when you interview potential employees, potential associates, uh, in your opinion, what are some indicators that uh, can tell you if that candidate is someone who's likely to be uh, service-oriented? Well, we, um, the questioning, and I would tell you that we use, um, we partner with a company called Aon Hewitt. Um, and the initial stage of interviews uh, actually will screen out persons who don't seem to have the uh, answers to questions that would indicate that they were screened for hospitality. Then, of course, there's face-to-face -face interviews that happen. So I think the question is kind of what are, you, what are you looking for? What kind of things do you see that would indicate that they would be great service? Well, uh, I, I would say that questions have become more and more behavioral over time. So what we will do is we will ask questions that are behavioral in nature, meaning tell me about a time when um, you had a, a challenging interaction with a guest or in your past job or a team member in your school or wherever it might have been and tell me how you resolve that problem. That's an example of a question that would indicate, aha, they're drawing on real world examples where they showed that they could, uh, um, they could demonstrate teamwork, they could demonstrate friendliness, warmth, and I think a lot of that face-to-face -face piece you pick, on, pick up on that just from a face-to-face -face interview. Great. With uh, so many properties around the world and so many brands, uh, how do you walk the line of being uh, consistent in terms of service, but still, you mentioned that it was important to also allow for cultural or regional you know, differences in taste or custom. How, how do you walk that line between consistency and catering to specific tastes? Well, I, thi I think that, um, I'll go back to my brand comment, that we know that a person who, who comes to stay at a Fairfield Inn, for example, knows that they are not going to receive all the bells and whistles that you receive at a Ritz-Carlton. Um, therefore, we design the services for the particular customer for that brand. In other words, customers have been identified to have certain hot buttons and needs that they have based on the brands that they would go through, whether it's luxury tier, whether it's your signature, or whether it's your economy. So we have to make sure that we, we model that depending upon what brand the guest is staying at. It, it, you wouldn't expect the same at a Ritz as you would at a, at a Fairfield Inn. So we target the services that are offered in a building based on the brand that we operate. So I don't know that it's so much of a fine line as it is just saying, you're here, this is what you can expect if you're staying with this brand. This is an interesting question. In your, uh, in your opinion, how have customers' expectations regarding service evolved over the last couple of decades, over your career? Wow. Um, they've changed a lot. And I think that you, you hear someone made the comment earlier about you know the customer is king. Well, when, when services, and particularly, I think it, it speaks well to a tough economy. When the economy is tough, um, the customers are much more discerning because they're much more conscious about where their dollars are going. Um, and so if you go back, we can go back five years, but we can go back further than that, that once you establish a certain level of service, well, then that becomes, that doesn't become the pinnacle, that becomes the baseline. So then what, are you gonna, what do you, have you done for me lately? Where do you go next? How do you take it up to another level, another level? So I would say that the customer expectations, even today, continue to grow higher and higher, uh, and we just have to be uh, ready for them. I, th I think that when you see room rates dropping, 
um, you know, the, the willingness of a property to say, well, we would normally sell this room at $150, but the economy being what it is, we're going to have to sell it for $99. The customer doesn't have any different expectations when they're paying $99 as when they were paying $150. Uh, so I think it's just a continual ratcheting up of what the customer experiences. And um, internet as an example, the use of technology, um, much more demanding, knowing that they have so many choices. And you know the, the market is filled with options for people in, in looking for hospitality, looking for hotels, that they know that they can demand more and more say, well, over at the other place, I got this. Can you do this for me? And you see more and more of that much more demanding customer. Great. Last one more from, the, from online, then I'll turn to the room here. Uh, a learner mentions terrific presentation. What advice would you give to organizations that might not have the infrastructure and resources of, of a Marriott, a smaller organization? Uh, that, that are looking to build stronger employee engagement and therefore customer service. What, what, what should a smaller organization focus on or tips, strategies? Yeah, I, th I think that, um, and we talk about resources, I mean, we have the, the benefit of, um, it, we do, like our surveying, for example, we do our surveying uh, internally, but it's provided to us from an external provider. So I think that since you don't have the, the ability to grab something like that in-house, I think if, if you're serious about it, and you're serious about driving set guest satisfaction through a more engaged workforce, I think you have to be willing to invest the time and the resources to go out, find somebody that can conduct and debrief that survey for you, or else you're not going to know the level. So even if you may not have the ability internally, I think you have to be willing to take that investment, you know, putting your money where your mouth is in terms of investing in the survey by an outside vendor to help you get, re and there's plenty of them out there. Uh, my question actually, um, goes along with the answer you give as, as far as the surveys. Um, I know as a customer, we're not always thrilled to, you know, put in the time and effort to fill out a survey. Um, are, are there certain steps or do you do research on how to increase the completion rate of the surveys? Um, we do. Um, I'm not 100% familiar with that, but I know that in, in any given month, um, there's a maximum that we, any property will, can get a maximum, but there's also the chance that if enough people didn't fill it out, you may get a low number of surveys, and that would obviously impact your score. You know, each excellent and each horrible score weighs a lot more if you only got 30 surveys than if you got 75 or 100 surveys. So you can't really control the response rate because it's completely voluntary. Um, it's all done electronically. It's all done by email. It's no paper surveys. Um, in, in room, there's in-room pieces that people can provide surveys with, but the real thing that counts are the ones that we electronically mail to our guests. And uh, it is a little bit of a crapshoot in terms of being able to drive those numbers. We can't force them to take the survey, but they research it all the time. I've stayed at Marriott over the years, probably 20, 30 years, uh, while in the military, and I've traveled in just about every state and stayed at Ritz and Fairfield, and I can tell you that whether I stayed at Fairfield or Ritz, the beds were always comfortable, and it was always good, rooms were clean. That was while I was in the military, and it was subsidized by everybody's in here taxes, <laughs> so I stayed at Marriott. Now. In later years, the one area that I didn't see you cover is economically how do we afford to stay at the Marriott because it is the best. And I prefer staying at Marriott than any other place, but economically it's difficult today. I guess you wait me say we should lower our prices, huh? Is that <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I, yeah, that's uh, that's a tough one. I mean, economically, how do we? You know, we'd love to have you, and, and I think that if you have economically outgrown in the wrong direction to stay in a, in, a, in a what we would call a full service versus a select service or extended stay property. Um, we'd love to keep you as a loyal customer, but I think if, you know, there comes a, a point at which we decide every day, we call them revenue managers. I don't know if you've ever heard the term, uh, terminology revenue managers. Revenue managers are the folks that determine what a given hotel will sell their rooms at at any given time of the day or the week based on business trends, how many check-ins, how many checkouts, what is the market demanding. Um, and I think I would say, and this is maybe sound a little, a little oversimplified, that you have to shop around. I think if you shop around, you can find reasonable rates no matter what the product is, uh, or else you may have to trade down in terms of going from a, a, um, a luxury tier to a standard to a select st service. That's, that's about all I could give you on that. Thank you. <laughs>
<coughs> you made me want to work for Marriott. <laughs> All right. But, uh, you know, a couple of interesting things uh, in what you stated. Uh, you know, the survey, you said you compare to other brands. So are you comparing to other hotels or just, like you said, you compare a Ritz to a ri other Ritz in other area? But you compare, do you compare also to other hotels in that class? Um, on the guest satisfaction side, yes, we do. Um, we, uh, we don't at the property level. This happens at the regional and at the uh, corporate level. They have a very good handle on where we stand compared to our major competitors like Hilton, Hyatt, Starwood. Uh, they know, because obviously those hotel companies also survey, they survey their guests and they're trying to find out what they're doing. So um, in recent years, um, where we had an uh, exceptional advantage in terms of how we compared to our, uh, our competitors, that gap has narrowed somewhat, which put a little bit of nerves in the world of Marriott, if you will. So we, we didn't, you know, our brand, our brand preference over our competitors, that gap has been narrow. They were quickly catching up to us, that that reinvigorated, re-energized us so we could really put more focus on the guest piece so we could widen that gap once again. But it is to other brands, but not an employee in the employee associate world, but in the guest world, yes, we do. Okay, and two other quick questions. You know, and, and I could testify yeah. that, I mean, I've stayed in Marriott in Amman, Jordan, or in Orlando, or Palm Spring, and, and even going internationally, I feel like I'm still in the US. I mean, the way everything is, and so the consistency is amazing. The, the question I had, you said something interesting. You said, the ladies of housekeeping. So do you guys not hire men to do housekeeping? Oh, that's, for an HR guy, that's a tough one. Uh, <laughs> We absolutely do, but the vast majority of our workforce who make rooms are female. And when you meet, and there are typically a team of housekeepers and a team of what we would call, you like this term, HR-wise, we call them house persons. A house person in other parlance would be a houseman, but they're the ones that are doing the delivery of linen, they're doing the general clean, so there are a team of men that work in housekeeping as well, but they're typically not the bed makers and the bathroom cleaners, typically, in, our, in, in, in U.S. culture. Tony, I want to thank you for a nice presentation first off. My name is Steve Holliday, and I'm starting an ethnography class today as wow. I hear your presentation which is an evaluation of cultural aspects of the diverse workforce we have in the U.S. and even internationally, because I've done my fair of international travel as well, and Marriott hotels have a standard of excellence around the world. I can attest to that too. So my question is, what type of a ethnographical study does Marriott perform when they go into a new worldwide market or evaluate a hotel in the U.S. with the diversity change in its workforce just because of the way the world is changing these days, the global environment? And what uh, points, particular points, would Marriott can use in such, in such a uh, evaluative study? Wow. <laughs> That's, that's a biggie. Um, I, I think internationally, and I can't speak to it from a personal level, but I know that when we began opening more businesses internationally, that, it, let, me, let me back up. At, at one point, we were able to staff our hotels, our executive and our management staff hotels. We would staff those from the U.S. Well, as the world has become smaller and hospitality has grown throughout the world, we then were able to staff those hotels, not with leaders and executives from the U.S., but leaders and executives from the markets in which they work. So that, that, that really played to our advantage. So as uh, our, us and our competitors and everyone began building and growing, we didn't have to worry about bringing expats from the U.S. to China or to um, Hong Kong or to Vietnam or, wherever they, or India where they might be doing business. We now can rely on, lo on locals who've worked in the, in the business, in the market, to tell us how things work here. So I, I don't know so much that it, it, it's studied specifically. I mean, you know the demographics of uh, when the, the research and development are people going, the feasibility folks are going in, they're looking at, hey, we're going to build a hotel in X location. They know what the ethnic makeup of, of you know, the age, the, the whole demographic piece, they know what that is. What they may have missed if they've never done business there is how is business done in that world? 
and they've got to do business the way business is done in that market. So in terms of study, the eth ethnography, is that what you, that was, that was a new word for me? I, would, well, I hope I uh, presented it correctly. Did that, I, I don't know if that helped to answer your question or not. So, so you can, uh, thanks. It, it did, and it sounds like you have, uh, Marriott at least has some type of substitute study programs that are in place to evaluate the local markets and also the conditions there before market entry is made. Yes. And from a revenue management or cost control standpoint, it actually makes sense to not use expats too. Mm -hmm. It absolutely does. You, and especially if you can hire local people who are bilingual English mm -hmm. and are, are trilingual or whatever. So I, 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 thanks for the uh, response. My pleasure. I'm a little confused. Uh -oh. uh, you're, you're, you're talking about having a linear model across all of the hotels and the brands, yet your data mining has to be different uh, from each culture. So how do you make the comparison between cultures if you've got a linear model? Well, when I talk about, when we, for example, the data that I showed you on the screen here, like this, for example, this is Marriott Hotels U.S. only. We're, we're not being compared to the others, uh, other parts of the world. That's something, the numbers are smaller internationally from full service properties. That data is collected separately. So they do do separate, they do do separate surveys and I can't speak to whether or not the survey questions are identical in other parts of the world. This is only U.S. data that I was providing. Okay, well, let me give you an example of this from the questions that have been asked. We've got a couple of people here that have talked about wherever they go in the world. Mm -hmm. Marriott's absolutely identical. And then another group saying that in each little corner, there's been a diversion to match the local culture. Oh, okay. You can't do both. Um, I would argue that maybe you can um, to some degree. I mean that... You can have, I use the, the Marriott Burger example. Now, you know, Marriott Burger may not go well in parts of the world, but it may still be on the menu for the people who travel from the U.S. That doesn't mean, though, that menu offerings, public space offerings, um, um, services in general can be tweaked to the local market. But some standards must remain in place in terms of service. I was just trying to figure out where you drew the line. I guess I don't have a, a, a great answer for you. Uh, a question about uh, social media. With, uh, it's no secret that in, in today's age, a dissatisfied customer has, you know, has mm -hmm. more potential reach, can be louder than, than mm -hmm. ever before. Mm -hmm. What does Marriott do about that? Do you have people that uh, do you participate in? Uh, uh, do you offer reviews, for example, or do you monitor social media sites and comment on them? What? Yeah, we have you know e-commerce people who who not only are talked about the marketing of our hotels, but are also monitoring all social media. You know, TripAdvisor, you know, Facebook, Twitter, any of those kind of things that um, we just have to monitor. It. And you know, you hear ads on the radio about you know some person can just put some horrible, nasty comment about about you out there. Uh, I I think generally though you have to look at it over, over the broader the broader base. You can't take one comment and say that defines us. We recognize that we study it, but we also have to be careful not to take one comment and say that, well, that means that the entire experience was bad for everybody. We need to see if there's patterns developing, and we can use social media to find out if patterns develop that way, just as we would from a regular survey. You know, you talked a lot about the employees, and you know, I, I agree 100% that you know, a happy employee will, will represent you well, and the customers will come back. I feel it's like when I go to Trader Joe, I feel like that, just like Marriott. It's like a happy environment. How do you rate? Do you have a rating system for their satisfaction at work? I mean, you have charted almost everything, but how do you gauge perfectly happy employee, and, and how do you reward them? Um, let me go back to this. Um, back to this piece. Um, you, you, that was kind of a two-part question, I think. You talked about rewarding as well. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know that I'm going to reward, reward you for being engaged, per se. Um, but in order for you to be engaged, there's, there's, certain, uh, there's a certain price of entry. I've got to provide you with competitive pay and benefits. I've got to provide you with a com comfortable work environment. I've got to provide you with great leadership. I've got to provide you with growth and opportunity. Those kind of things will say, okay, you're, if you score high or you feel high on those particular topics, then you'll evaluate me in a certain fashion. 
I would tell you in terms of evaluating, we would evaluate your ability to provide exceptional service. So, so every, and again, talking US market, uh, every hourly associate and every supervisor and every manager, different for manager, supervisor separate and rank and file hourly associates, they are all evaluated on the same criteria in terms of their performance. Um, but we don't use a, a, a link between, hey, you're highly engaged that you get a better rating, but likely you would because if you're more engaged, you're going to be delivering that exceptional service. Does that answer your question or not? I, I actually, I was trying to see how you evaluate their, their satisfaction level. So how do you gauge that all the employees are happy actually working for you or if the morale is down or you see what I'm saying? Yeah, we, this, this tool and uh, there is about a 53 question survey that we do once a year. And it, the questions that we asked are chunked into these five, top, these five categories. L huge majority of them around leadership and quality of life at work. Some on teamwork, personal growth, and total rewards. But we ask 50 questions. And then, since I don't know, and we have to keep it confidential, I don't know how you know, Consuelo answered the survey, but I know how everybody in that department answered the survey. So you start by gauging the, the, the engagement health of that particular department. Then you look at the engagement health of the whole hotel, and it becomes clearly obvious that certain departments seem to have a higher level engagement than others, right? So without finding out that, you know, the, the manager's typical MO is say, oh, I want to know who answered bad on the survey. Who, who gave me a bad rating? That's kind of this typical, I want to find out who marked me down on the survey. We don't approach it like that. We approach the department as a whole. We dialogue with them, gather information from them about, okay, what's working well, what's not working well? What do we need to do to make it a better place to work? And you, you tell us. And then we ask that department as a group, to define what their top three or four things are. That doesn't mean that one disgruntled employee's issue is or is not going to get on that top four. It might or it might not. Does that help? Yes. Okay. Yes, Tony. Uh, my interest is in actually in the drivers of associate engagement, in particular the leadership excellence. So I kind of have a two-part question. First of all, what skill set or leadership dimensions are you actually measuring? And secondly, based on what Marriott has learned from the annual survey, what is the most important leadership dimension that you've identified? We measure, um, under leadership excellence, we measure recognition for a job well done. We measure um, whether leadership listens to and acts upon the suggestions made by employees, um, both at the senior exec level as well as at the line supervisor level. So that, those are a couple of things that we really think are important. Listening to me and acting on the things that I bring to your attention and rewarding and recognizing me beyond a paycheck, showing recognition and appreciation. And what was the second part of your question? So what do you think is the most important leadership dimension? Hmm. That's a loaded question. Everyone would answer that differently. For me personally, I think you have to be a leader who sincerely shows a sincere interest and care for the people that work for you. I mean, and I, there's many ways to demonstrate that. You know, there's always been this talk about, gee, I don't socialize with my workers, right? Because that could be dangerous. But I would tell you that from a personal perspective, I think it is okay to socialize with the people you work with. You just need to know where that line is. Uh, because you need to get into knowing who these people are, not in extreme detail, but you need to know something about them beyond the fact that they're checking people in or cooking food or making beds every day. So you need to learn, the, the leader's ability to learn about the whole person is going to make them a better, a better leader. It's a learning model, so that's exactly what I was Absolutely. Okay, I think we have time for just a, a couple more here. Uh, obviously, Marriott's a world leader in terms of uh, service, but as I think you alluded to, you know, no company bats, you know, bats a thousand in this regard. In, in your opinion, what are the, just a couple of the most common or most critical service-oriented mistakes that, that you see made? Um, let's see. Well, I go back to some of those drivers. I'll flip back just to kind of refresh my memory here if I can get to them. Um, I, I'm not so sure that these are, are there. I, I, I think w what I would say is, Let's say that there's a service failure of any kind. 
Um, I didn't have the room type I requested. I couldn't check in at the time. I, you know, my breakfast was late. Breakfast is huge, by the way. Breakfast is huge. Um, and it has to be on time. It has to be hot. Um, I think what we've learned, though, is that the ability to have what we call a service recovery. So something happens in, in, improperly. How well do we do at recovering? What we often see from a, a guest is, you know, I tried to check in, my room wasn't ready, I was anticipating an ocean view room, I didn't get an ocean view room. However, the service was so exceptional that I, I kind of overcame that. Um, I think that um, if I could say there's a general, uh, a, a general service failure that happens, I think it's maybe timely responsiveness to issues. I brought something up, um, I was told that I was going to that problem would be resolved for me, and I waited half an hour, I waited two hours, and still no result. So I think that that ability to service recover is really key. No matter what the problem went, that went wrong, um, the ability to service recover is really the key.